Book of Boba Fett Chapter 4 is back with a bridge episode that really connects everything that's been going on in the Book of Boba Fett 2 timelines and The Mandalorian for a much, much more cohesive and better episode this week. Stick around for our Star Wars Lads review of the Book of Boba Fett Chapter 4. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's episode of the Book of Boba Fett Reviews with Star Wars Lads. This is Chapter 4, The Gathering Storm. This is going to be a full spoiler review, so if you have not watched the episode, make sure you watch it before you watch this review, or if you don't care about spoilers, continue watching this review. But go ahead and watch that episode before you check out our episode. <laughs> Otherwise, we will let you know all the major plot points that are going on and some of the things that we might think happen next week and further into the show. But before we do all of that, please hit that like button down below, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you're notified whenever Star Wars Lads videos come out. We post videos three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but with Boba Fett, we have a bit more modified schedule. This week will be four videos, last week was five, some weeks will be three. It's going to be all around, but never less than three as we continue for the next four weeks with the Book of Boba Fett until we get past Chapter 7. So now to get into the Book of Boba Fett Chapter 4, The Gathering Storm. Uh, so if you guys have been following along with our reviews, uh, you know, last week I, I was pretty fed up with this show. I, I was very bothered by what we got. There were so many things I did not like about last week. Even in, in rewatching it, you know, it is it, it it's not a terrible episode. It's not really a bad episode in, per se. It's just disappointing. And rewatching it, I think... It confirmed all of those things that I didn't like about Chapter 3 and and reaffirmed the parts I did like that we did talk about last week. But Chapter 4, right off the bat, marked improvement. It, it's far more cohesive, I would say. That's my biggest takeaway with this. This is the cohesive vision that we kind of thought we were getting when the Book of Boba Fett started. It took till Chapter 4, and we said last week, this was the Make or Break episode. And it didn't have to wow us. It just had to say, what is the story? Where is this going? And why is Boba Fett here? Why Tatooine? What does he want? We hadn't really understood what he wants yet. And now we finally understand at least the direction that this is going. Things are confirmed. Things aren't moving around all the time. Like the twins aren't showing up in an episode and leaving the next one. It's it's not so many moving pieces. This is finally a main through line story, a stream, streamlined narrative that we've got here. And I dug this episode. There was a lot of things I really, really liked about it. I think we'll start out with the flashbacks here because that's the first half of this episode. And this episode is the closest to like 50-50 we get. I think the flashbacks still take over probably 60% or so, 65%. But at least with story importance, there is a solid 50-50 where it is you have important story on both sides. And that's what we've been kind of waiting for. So starting with the flashback, I was surprised... So we're still not really clear on the time jump here because this episode starts with Boba finding Finnick and not finding Finnick in a way that we kind of predicted on like, you know, teaming up with her to take down the Nikto gang. He finds her just lying on the ground like we see in the Mandalorian chapter five. And that's how they meet. And I, I dug their f first interaction. Uh, we do get more tie in with the modders and, and all of that stuff from last week. So that's why they were introduced last week and into this week so that we know how, what they're like and what their whole technology is. For me, it's still a little cyberpunky, uh, but it it was fine in this context because we knew what we were getting. And I think if we had just seen this episode and not seen last week, I think honestly it might've worked better because <laughs> we don't know that like other side of like the weird people who were riding around on the Vespas type thing. But uh it's still a little cyberpunky, but for me, it worked. I liked their first conversation. I liked that he's heard of her. He recognized her. He saved her for a reason because he needed her. That felt more Boba than we've been getting. And then she immediately, upon hearing his name, knows who he is. And she's like, okay, you're Boba Fett. He's dead. And he's like, he's like, no, I'm not dead. And they have that nice interaction. I enjoyed all their interactions in this. And, and everything really... That, goes on at Jabba's Palace. I thought that was all great. We got to see a little droid from the Clone Wars. Uh, I looked it up. I couldn't, I, I had no idea what the name of this type of droid was. It's an LEP servant droid. Uh, let us know down in the comments if you knew that right off the top of your head. I'd be pretty impressed. But yeah, that was pretty cool. I like any type of stuff like that, any type of reference. And, and uh, we got all that in this episode. I really enjoyed this flashbacks in this. I felt like 
It was more true to what I wanted to see from Boba. This is a man on a mission. We start to get a little bit more of a sense, and 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 at least we get a reason for why he's on Tatooine. And even if it's not as like deep or philosophical as we might have thought it would be, based on the first couple episodes of the show, he's here for revenge, and he's here to take out everybody who's wronged him. And he just wants to set up his own stuff, do his own thing, rule his own way, and take out everybody who's ever wronged him. And I I dug all that. So anyway, what did you think of the flashback in this episode? I mean, I, I think I agree with basically everything you're saying, but I, I also found like an interesting through line that, again, like you, I had issues with episode three, but this through line that I was seeing, you know, it like kind of like fell a little off last episode. Like I was like, is it even there? Was it just me making things up? Now I felt like it was there. Like, like you're saying, yeah, now we get the purpose of, you know, the whole point in Boba and the Mandalorian. Like, what's going on with him and with Tatooine? What is his connection to wanting to become a crime lord? Like, all these things kind of happen. And I, I think, in a way, you have to also realize that Boba Fett, out of everyone in Jabba's palace, is the only one who really understands, other than Jabba himself, you know, what a Jedi can do. Right. And after you seeing a rancor die and all this and that, sure, he gets knocked into the pit by Han. And I think that's a whole nother story that deals a lot of his I don't know, I don't want to say just trauma, but his personal relationship with Han. I think he's got a lot of beef there that still is unaddressed. But you know, like when he says like yeah, when we could make money, when we could do things that we don't have to risk our people and our assets for our bosses would just do those, these things and throw us out there. And it made me think like, yeah, I mean, this is a dude whose last moment in his armor at like the peak of his powers was just knocked out by some random blind dude. It is a little bit of like a retconning. It is more of a recontextualizing of like, hey, like this wasn't just some silly choreography. This was a dude who not only ran headfirst into a situation he's gonna know he's gonna lose because it's a jedi and he's dealt with them through the clone wars and he knows no one else really has here insult to injury he got knocked into a pit by a guy who can't see and it's just like wow like that's that's annoying and like that wasn't necessary for him to do but you know that's something that he has to do because he's jabba's like young pup he's got to do what it takes for money and, and even though he's fought back against boba a little bit more like had a little bit more independence growing in the war of the bounty hunters saying what he wants what he deserves all this and that he's still just treated as like a pawn a rook or knight he's never treated as like someone who's like not necessarily an equal but someone who's like who's really you should listen to like you should take his opinion seriously he's not the best for no reason but he's treated like just an asset like a tool so I don't know. It also tied back to me and a lot of the stuff just reading the comics and all that. We talked about this before off of the screen, but it always felt like to me there's like been a lot of discrepancies with who Boba is. Like who Boba is in the original trilogy obviously was a totally different character than who George Lucas made him out to be in the prequels and then what him and Filoni did in the Clone Wars. So he goes from a guy who's, you know, a young idolizer. Then he suddenly loses his father. Everyone wants him to literally be Django. He wants to be Django. It's just the cycles of inner dialogue and physical re- like reiteration. Like, you have to be Django. You're just a clone. So you have to be as good as Django. This is your life. It's all this. And he, he's going through all these ups and downs as a kid. And he got he lost his only family. He lost Zam. He lost Django. He lost the Kaminoans. Right? He lost that peace that idolization of the bounty hunter world and he got thrown into the world as best as he could and everyone is telling him you got to be this you got to be that he gets his own family on tattooing with his own little syndicate he thinks that you know he's becoming who he's supposed to be he's got a leader slash mentor in cad bane he's thinking he's going to become his own bounty hunter but cad bane in the unfinished reels essentially just wants to train boba because he wants to have a chance of killing Django at the end of the day Again, no one respects who Boba is throughout his life. And his own syndicate eventually does betray him in the plan. Stars 1313. Maybe we'll see that. Maybe we won't in some sort of media. But this man's been going through ups and downs and ups and downs with his character. And everyone's just 
treated him as a Django number two and all this and that. So by the time the Imperial era comes around, he's just an, like a wild dog and unleashed down. He will kill for money. He doesn't care about honor, ethics, or having a relationship with anyone else. He's just here for the money and nothing else. And that, I mean, that in a way, when you don't have anything other than bloodlust in your eyes, something like a Han Solo who's like a cheery scoundrel with his own little family who he probably sees throughout his time as a bounty hunter grow into the rebellion, has his own family and all that. That's got to make you frustrated. That's got to make you agonizing. And then you get beat up and thrown into the Sarlacc and everything about your life that you worked for, been thrown into, it's gone. You've lost your armor. You've lost the one thing that you had that was pure in your life from your father. That's gone too. So this man has been through so many ups and downs and ups and downs that I was like, okay, so where are you going with this character? How are you going to make this all work out for me? And this episode just made it work out for me because it's like, you know what? He's finally just trying to be himself. He's finally got a real family that isn't, you know, trying to make him into anything. He's not, they take him in, the Tuscans take him in. They let his kid realize what it feels like to be in a family to let the worry within him become balanced once more and the chief is a representation of like hey this is who i can be a leader with honor and codes reminiscent of my father but what good intentions behind it he has a stronger connection to tattooing once more and bam now i was like wow this is great and then episode three happened and i'm just like what the hell is going on like the family that he's working for is he not going to help the tuscans grow is he not going to Continue to note, they're cut out right away. And I was just so frustrated. But this fourth episode fixed things because he learned all those values from those people from that situation. He says he's willing to give up bounty hunting because he finally had peace and clarity with who he was. He finally got to be himself. This man was happy being dead for four or five years if it meant that he could just be him instead of thrown into all these stupid fights being judged as something he's not, not ever allowed to be anything more than the silent man in armor, which he was never supposed to be. He's not supposed to be like Din wearing his helmet all the time. He's still a dude. He's still Boba Fett. So now I feel like, hey, we're finally, even if it isn't the character I expected, I can at least say like after all of his ups and downs to all these different mediums, he finally feels like a character that has purpose. And you still see the things that have been balanced out in him. He's still the ruthless killer. The what the scene with the Nikto gang and the slave one, I'm like, he's not just like some lovable guys just scratching a bantha. He's like, I will kill you. I'm still the hunter and all that. But like it has a purpose now. It feels like it's not just a guy that is just stretched thin doing all these things just because he has to or because someone else is poning him around. He finally just feels like a person who has his own value for himself. He manages to take everything else that's shaped him and put it together, but now he feels like he has a true sense of clarity and order. And he doesn't want people to go through the same things that shaped his life on Tatooine, on Camino, throughout the Clone Wars. That's why he wants to help the people of Tatooine who go through so much struggle already to live, to have like clarity and freedom, to have guidance, which is more than anything that I could have expected out of Boba, but I absolutely loved it. There were so many great shots in this as well, too. Like, like I love that you brought up the the Dicto gang scene because you know that yeah. the way they set that up in the last episode, we were expecting okay, he's gonna you know ride a bantha up to him and take them all out one by one. I like this so much better. This yeah. is this is real Boba Fett, and I love that shot how it it tracks the, on the. It, it's basically on a speeder of one of the Nictos. Like, it's riding along with them, and all of a sudden you nice see the slave one angle. come into frame, like, <laughs> slowly out of the distance, and you're just like, uh-oh. And he just lets it rain down on top of them. That was such a great shot. I love that. And the filmmaking in general behind this episode, so much better. Like, oh, so yeah. much better. It was so oh, much... Yeah. The action was crisper. Uh, the Black Chrysanthemum fight, which we'll talk about a little later... That was a little more intense. That was faster. It, it, everything was more faster, more kinetic. It, it just felt it, it felt more brutal. And in the last episode, it felt like it had that fun edge to it. That kind of that kind of like I, I don't want to say cheesy. I want to more, say more like campy edge to it because it was just like there was there was that level of camp to it in the last episode. This was this was Boba Fett. This was him taking people out this was him not caring who you are not caring what he has to go against 
and, and the Sarlacc pit scene as well. Um, well I love that yeah. we got like a, a <laughs> wrap up with that because he's, I mean, he literally almost died and he was in there for however long. And he does make a weird, like he makes a weird comment in the slave one where he's like, this is where I lost my armor years ago. So I wasn't sure how long he's necessarily in the Sarlacc pit also combined with how long he's with the Tuscan Raiders and all of that. It, yeah. The timelines are all messed up. But besides that, that scene was great because this is Bo. He's, he's willing to go back to this thing that almost killed him and take it on head on. Like he, he's just going straight in. I, that was also an incredible shot. There is a shot from inside oh, yeah. the Sarlacc pit where you see the slave one just slowly like cover up the entire opening in the pit. All of that was great. I love yeah. that scene in general. The seismic charge, everything was so great in that scene. Um, and, and really, the second half of the flashback, the first half I liked, and I liked the yeah. Jabba's Palace stuff. It was all fine, but it still had that little like campiness to it that the other couple episodes have had, uh, when Boba's chasing a droid through the like <laughs> the the cafe or, or the kitchen of the of Jabba's Palace. Like you know that that's the type of stuff that we've seen a lot in this show that we might not necessarily associate with Boba Fett. But then the second half of this episode, basically from the shootout of them stealing the Slave One on, all of that was just gold. And it's some of the best yeah. Boba Fett stuff we've gotten in the show as a whole. And I, I love the Sarlacc scene. Oh, yeah. I mean, he just has so much agency in this episode. Like, he knows who he is now. Like you said, he is that killer. That's never going to be out of him. It's been forced on him, and he's embraced it in different times of his life. But now it feels like he knows when to turn it on and off. Like, yeah... I, I thought the droid scene was a little too funny-ish, right? I like the chef droid. I like the other droids. I thought that was a, like a nice blend of like prequel and original trilogy stuff. And then that yeah, little... Like General Grievous homage almost. Right, like a little <laughs> spitty, right? I, I, loved, I loved that stuff. I love that we saw some old school Gamorreans too who aren't just their bellies. We saw like, you know, like a little bit more... I don't want to say like... I can't say if they're fatter because now when I've seen them both on the same medium on television, it feels like they're just different purposes, right? One is meant the guys with the belly showing are meant to be like fighters in a pit. And these guys are meant more just be like glorified heavyweights. You know, they, they wear a little leather. They're around Bib Fortuna, but being around Bib Fortuna, I don't really expect much out of you. You're just there. You're just fodder. But yeah, I mean, that's the thing. This episode gave him that agency where he could turn it on and off when he wanted to, right? Fennec is like, you've gotten soft. And he's like, no, I didn't get soft. I have a new perspective. I realize now that I need a tribe because he literally went through three, four years of just living without that tribe. And that's that Tuscan tribe is still stuck in his mind because it just relates to so much of what he's gone through throughout his life. And that's that's where one of my issues with episode three has gotten got worse watching this episode because sure you can have the Tuscans die quickly, but that episode doesn't also need to be 38 minutes long. You could add two or three more minutes to the present day scenes, and you could add another five or six to just show, even in a montage of like he's just years have gone by and he's just trying to get revenge when he can he's just a one-man army he's gonna do what he can to finally defeat the nictos but not this time not this time like he it's it's burning away at him but instead this episode we kind of have to make that leap of like oh it's four years in we're in the mando timeline that's the ah, robert rodriguez b movie aficionado or not sometimes you have to also understand you're in a serialized tv format where the story has to all connect into like one grand book or movie. You can't just expect me to think that three years has happened. If you just see him after like six months max, right? He lost his family at six months max. Like uh, that, that now, that now that is my bigger problem than the slow Vespa scene in the last episode. But um, there was also like an interesting, like meta context scene. Like, if you looked at the Sarlacc pit, when we see it, right, we see just the classic look of it where it's just the teeth and the little tendrils and all that. But then the special edition has like the beak mouth thing, right? So he gets closer to it. You're like, oh, did they, I almost felt for a second, I'm like, did, did they like retcon it like for a second? Like what happened here? And then it shot out obviously, right? And you're like, okay, it looks way better than it did in the special edition version. I can live with this fine. 
but the seismic charge goes into it and destroys it. So it's like, in a way, saying like, yeah, it's canon, sure. But we kind of liked how it looked originally at the same way. I, I like that. I feel It feels like you're appeasing like the canon only people and like the release order people were like that's not the star like i knew it felt like a nice little meta commentary there um but yeah i, I think I, what, what i want to ask you do you think that he says fire spray gunship because that's the name of his ship fire spray now i know people have been saying like oh that but fire spray is technically the class i don't know if you can really say my ship I don't know. He could say my ship, the slave one. I don't know if they've renamed him. I think they're just trying to like skirt around saying it. I don't think there's any removal of that, but I don't know. I want to hear your opinion there. I agree. I, I caught that too as well. And I was, we, we talked a lot about this leading up to the show, what they were going to do with this. And um, I, I, I do agree. I think it's them just trying to get around saying it. it. It's never said in the movies anyways. So, they don't really have to say it. I think we all know what it is and everybody's no one's going to stop referencing it to it as the slave one. Like it's been the slave one for 40 years. So that's going to be in everybody's head and until they officially come out and say, no, this is not the name. So as long as they're skirting around it, I think every person is who's talking about it is going to still refer to it as slave one. And, and until they say it in the show, I think, I think that's what we're going with for now. All right. I mean, I mean that I, I that's what I thought too. I just wanted to get that out of the way for people watching and for all those people on Instagram and YouTube ready to make a clickbait saying, "Oh man, the fire spray is now officially the name Slave One and a social justice." Work. And like, no, man. He literally says fire spray gunship. If you wanted to say it's called the fire spray, he would have called fire spray. That's it. But he says gunship, which made me hesitate. I'm like. Is he just talking about the type of ship he has without saying the name? That's how it sounded to me, but I just I just yeah. wanted to hear someone else's opinion. Yeah, and, and Finnick, yeah. you know, doesn't necessarily know what the name of his ship is, right? So yeah. he's going to describe it more as the make and model, right? Like right. he doesn't he she doesn't know his nickname for it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so I think it makes sense in a story perspective too. Right. Well. When we when we look at the Falcon, like other characters just are like, oh, that's just an old white tea freighter, right? It's literally said in the movies and stuff. And he's like, no, that's not just any ship. That's the Falcon, right? Only the people who really know it, know it. Like on a Imperial Records register, it's not going to say Millennium Falcon. It's going to be YT 1300 and whatever its serial number is essentially. So I can live with it. I can also see them trying to skirt around saying it because, you know, connotations. You don't really want to say it. But at the same time, it's not retcon, so that 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 leaves me happy. I think there's some thematic value of it being called Slave One still. So let's move on to the present day and talk about what happens there because we don't get too much time with it, but there are important story beats. And finally, we've hit all the moments from the trailers. Uh, we get our meeting that we've been talking about for the last four weeks of Boba Fett with all the other crime lords who are basically fill-ins for what Bip Fortuna had set up as the power structure during his time as Daimyo. And we got that meeting, but before we get that, we get a cool moment with Black Kersantan and Trandoshans, which harken back to, you know, whether it's the Clone Wars that you've seen with the Chewbacca episodes with Trandoshans hunting down people like that, or the comics that we reference and the Gladiator Pits and all that stuff. We get those nice moments in here with Black Kersantan, you know, <laughs> He he hates Trandoshans, as most Wookiees do, but he is the one that is going after it, and we get a nice arm-out-of-socket moment, like the one that was a cut from Force Awakens. This one was a lot more brutal, a little less comedic. Uh, I love yeah. that fight. Like I said earlier, the filmmaking, much higher level in terms of the, the kinetic nature of the action, uh, and we didn't get huge fights, but just the ferocity of Black Kersantan in this scene it yeah. was a lot more to what I had imagined from reading a comic than last episode where it was a lot more wide. There was a lot less cutting. He does a lot of like swinging around and flailing his arms and getting stabbed. But like I felt last episode, kind of the point of the fight was almost like he's an impossible beast to take down, right? Like he's, mm -hmm. he's just hard to beat. He's, he's a tank basically. And in this, we got to see the fast, furious nature of his fighting he beats people up it's, nobody can lay a hand on him he's all over the place so you can kind of see the different styles there 
I think both work for giving us context on what this character is like for those people who haven't read the comics, to seeing a faster, more kinetic version of him. And then last week, seeing the guy that literally just can't be beaten. He has to be dropped in a hole to be beaten, and he's never actually yeah. beaten. And so I, I like... I kind of like both still. I, I think last week it was still a highlight for me, even though I do like this better. But it was a great moment, at least. Yeah, I mean, he feels like he's more got like a bone crunching element to him this fight, right? Obviously, the Trandoshans look amazing, both in the dinner scene and this. Like you see their eyes slid around, and there's like some like noise effect too that they add to it that I felt was really cool. Um, but like yeah i i think like what you said last fight like it feels very classic like wookie fighting kind of like chewbacca where he can just throw around people this and that um and i don't think he's i mean he is trying to kill boba but he has also worked with boba so i think he's a little bit more cautious there like yeah i'm, I'm just trying to like i'm trying to use the element of surprise i'm trying to catch him off guard without his armor this and that and boba fumbles a little bit with his armor but once he gets the gaffy stick out, you know, he stabs him through that thick hide and fur. Like, you know, he's he's got to be in some pain. And then he's cornered a bit. You know, he's a little out-muscled. Yeah, but this one felt like, you know, obviously Trandoshans are always hunting Wookiees for sport and all that. So it's that bloodlust that's just built into Wookiees, the disgust, the distaste at Trandoshans. I kind of felt bad for the Trandoshans. These guys are just having fun. Like, I, I don't know. I honestly kind of feel like these are, like, Trandoshans that would never, like, been, you know, they, they feel like the type of kids who are just a little too wealthy, had a little too much fun, and they're, they've are they never been, like, you know, tied in with their traditions. They're just like, ah, I just like getting drunk with my friends and wasting money. They kind of felt like a crew like that. But because they're Trandoshan, it doesn't mean much they're, they're gonna get destroyed and yeah you could see like he wasn't he could have easily just thrown them and flung them around the room and there were some like interesting spins and stuff that he did with them but he obviously was using more of the knuckle bracers he was here to leave like an impact pain and all of this and that and i loved how the canon comic background of who he is you know is double down here like we have uh, Madame Gar says she's like, oh, back in the day, thousands of people used to cheer you on in the gladiator pits. You were the greatest of the chrysanthemum and all of this and that, right? And I was like, yeah, it's nice to nice that we're still building up his canon um, background for viewers who've never read the comics. I love that. And she's like, oh, she's trying to convince him. She's almost got him there. And he's like, yes, but no. And he just rips off just one arm. And <laughs> it's just, it's like, oh, wow. So yeah, this one felt like he was faster yes but he's putting more weight and pain he's like literally trying to leave a mark in any way possible last time it was like i'm trying to kill you but i also know you're boba fit so i i could i could i can see the reasoning and i like that there's a variety to his fight and so it lets him be a little bit more ferocious and unpredictable that in a way that even chewbacca really isn't like chewbacca is more of a lifting up sort of guy hit the bowcaster throw you against the wall this guy feels like I can do a lot of things. I could probably claw out your face maybe next episode. And I would be like, yeah, that totally feels like something you do. He's a guy who's got a lot of tricks up his sleeve. But um, yeah, I mean, after that scene, we got uh, that nice dinner party. I, I, I think I loved how I like, <laughs> I didn't even realize this where they were being seated at. I was like, okay, this is the trailer stuff. It's not too much. We kind of know some will agree. We've kind of had the politics set up. Well, this and that. And they're like, what's in it for us and like why should we ever do anything for you and then the rancor is underneath and they're literally on top of the rancor pit like that's just some strategic putting it and boba's boba's also there too and he's not worried at all like that made me feel like man not only has he's got agency he's coming into himself once more he's like i'm healed now so i'm gonna play who i am i am he feels that re that that's just another scene that felt fully realized with him Absolutely. This was this episode just felt so much better because it, it feels like Boba finally. <laughs> and, you know, whether like there's always been the idea of like in the flashbacks, right? It, it doesn't necessarily have to feel like Mandalorian Boba because it's five years before. But now in the present day, we had Mandalorian Boba. <laughs> now present day Boba has been way inferior, just getting his butt kicked right and left 
not knowing anything that's going on. Every random citizen's telling him what's going on in his city. <laughs> he doesn't know anything about anything. In this scene, we finally got to see him talk down to people. Like He was the top dog in this scene, finally. And, and I think it's what we've been waiting the whole show for, honestly. And I, I feel like it should have been there since episode one, at least in the present day. But it's here now, and hopefully it keeps going into the future. And just everything from the rancor thing to knowing the intimidation tactics knowing how to talk to these people not just preaching about respect and all this stuff knowing how to talk to cri criminals <laughs> like that's Bo boba should know how to do that he's a criminal himself for years he should know yeah. how to do all this stuff like, <laughs> yeah he really is like now now we finally get to see it all come together and and was it worth maybe three episodes of setting this up no but but now it's here and now we can finally get into the story i think we've all been wanting the whole time oh, yeah. and it makes me super excited for next week because i'm still not sure if i dig the idea that the pikes are going to be at least the main villain for most of the season until we eventually get a reveal probably that somebody else is behind it i i would have liked to see somebody different but again this i'm up for some type of crime war i think this is gonna be a cool ending we're gonna end up seeing him ride the rancor it's gonna we're gonna, there's a lot of cool things that are be, gonna be coming and it's just Whoa. some shots that i hope they saved all their budget for because it started to feel like the budget was back in scenes for this where the budget seemed gone last week mm. now it was back in some scenes for this with the sarlacc and stuff like that hopefully it continues to pick up and we're starting to get bigger and bigger episodes as we work our way towards the end because They've got my attention again, at least. Like I'm, I'm looking forward to chapter five. I, I still am cautiously yeah. optimistic, but yeah. I'm at least looking forward to it. No, I mean, I was betting on these four episodes, not necessarily all being connected sequentially, but like getting us banger after banger after banger after banger. And this episode was great. I'd say I, I did notice some scenes with the slave one trying to escape the hangar. It felt like a little bit of it was a little cheaper on some shots like some of it is because it's also shot like in the it's supposed to be dark it's supposed to not have lights in it it didn't feel as great as it could have been but then the moment they got the slave one out and it was just the sarlacc scene and then flying in on the nikto swoop gang like yeah oh baby oh that that's when like i was like yeah there's that budget they they're like yeah it's the dark whatever we'll do we'll just do enough right but we want to see it in the bright light the ship in its full glory and oh man he he unleashed some prequel like missiles that he had from attack of the clones too onto this one specific speeder bike i love that i love that but you know i i agree i think i think the last episode i, I don't want to say the vespa's I feel like I can understand why the Vespas might have been a little harder tech wise to work on the instead of just pure CGI screen and using like the volume. It could have been done better regardless because I just don't I don't vibe with a lot of Robert Rodriguez execution. I like where he's coming from, but his execution has always thrown me off. But this episode felt great because even if I had moments where I was like, ah, I could I, I don't know if I love that. There was always something that immediately got me back on board. It was maybe like 5% of scenes that I was like, eh. But I was like, oh, 95%? I was like, wow, that's awesome. That's exciting. I was hyped for it all the way through. Perked up my energy this night. I was like, whoa, like some of that was awesome. And then to end on that beautiful little sound, the Mandalorian theme. Oh, Din Djarin is coming in the next episode for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and if you want to hear our, our thoughts on that, and the rest of what could happen in Chapter 5, check out our Book of Boba Fett, Chapter 5 Predictions and Speculation, which will be out on Friday. As always, we do it every single week for the next episode, Chapter 5, Chapter 6, Chapter 7, and then eventually, hopefully, Season 2 Speculation, if we get that confirmed. So we'll be talking about that on Friday, but that's it for our Chapter 4 review of the Book of Boba Fett. Thank you all so much for watching. If you haven't yet, please hit that like button down below and subscribe to the channel. We release Star Wars content, like I said, three days a week minimum, sometimes four, sometimes five days a week. Depends on what the schedule is like for Boba Fett, but we will be covering everything Boba Fett until the show is over and into the future. Comment down below. Let us know what you thought of Chapter 4. Did it live up to your expectations? Was it a lot better for you than Chapter 3 was like it was for us? Did you want more? What did you like? What did you dislike? Comment below. Let us know. We'd love to talk to you guys in the chat down below. 
and then stick around for comic reviews tomorrow on Thursday. We will have those. I believe it's High Republic 13 and a couple others. High Republic 13 should be the big one. If you haven't checked out our Fallen Star review, we did one last Monday for non-spoiler and this Monday for spoiler. If you want to talk spoilers, it's a big full spoiler discussion on Monday. So you'll want to check that out. And then, yeah, come back for Friday for predictions and speculation. We'll have all of that for Chapter 5 and in the future. Now that we've passed some of the trailers and stuff, we can really uh, get into the nitty gritty of what might happen here. So thanks so much for watching and we'll see you on Friday. Mm -hmm.